Hi everyone, welcome back. So this is our second lecture about Diane Leake's memoir, A Member of the Family. And the reason that I decided to break this lecture into two parts, um, in part, is because I um, wanted to separate the murders that occurred with the Manson family from really the rest of Diane's story. A lot of people go into this book thinking that it'll be all of them really heavily focused on the murders, and it is not. It starts about seven or eight years before she meets the Manson family. That is told in about the first 10 chapters. Around chapter 10 or 11, she meets Charles Manson and is brought into the family. And then um, around chapter, I think around 20, she is able to be extricated from that situation. Um, she talks about her role in the trial and trying to kind of recover from being in the group. She was not part of the murders and she was not there on those nights, but she saw things that happened before leading up to them and after. And so because of that, she was asked to testify. But the the actual like aftermath of the murders themselves and hearing about what happened is really like part of a chapter in the book. The bigger story is really her incredible journey um, through life and coming of age in the 60s while all of this is happening and how, how she was able to overcome all of that. And I really think that um, similar to what we saw with the book Educated, we have someone here who... Um, if the Manson murders had not occurred and it had been a different like cult or commune that she had brought it, been brought into, um, I think it would have been just as interesting a story. Um, I compare it to Educated because we have some similar themes of parentification, which I'll get into a little bit later, um, uh, a lack of education and an unstable home life. It also can be compared to the book that we're going to look at um, later by Ruth Reichel, Tender at the Bone, uh, My Adventures at the Table. That book, Ruth Reichel really describes her role um, in the food movement and, and being a hippie and living on a commune in the late 1960s and early 1970s. But Ruth is um, at that point, I think 22, 23. And so it's a totally different experience for her. Um, and also because of the commune that she got involved in quite a more gentle one. But this is something that is going on in this period of time that you have people, um, particularly in California, but in some other places of the country, who are gravitating toward um, looking for different spiritual ideas and a, a mind-opening experience, particularly through drugs and um, communal living to kind of put off the traditions of the past and to throw those away and to look for a new way of doing things. So that's really where the book kind of opens. Um, and then we see the darker elements of that, the dark side of the 1960s, the, the criminal element that came in and the criminal element that kind of um, tried to exploit those things, some of which is still going on today. So when Diane's story opens up, her parents, and I want you to know something about her parents, they are likely, when she starts this story, probably around 24, 25, maybe 26, they got married quite young, right out of um, high school, and so her, um, her story begins when she's about six or seven, and essentially, we see this, um, this thing that's played out in a lot of American media, and I want to say that for many people, the 1950s were not just stifling and kind of oppressive and um, conformist. But for Diane's father, really, that is how he felt. So we see him trying to go through this process of listening to um, a different type of music, 
um, listening, reading poetry um, and, and looking at stuff by the Beat Poets, by Jack Kerouac and by Allen Ginsberg. And these people who were saying like, break free from the shackles and, and do something different and be a part of something else. And um, so essentially, I would like you to, to think about two things. Number one, sorry, I think she tries to empathize with him a little bit and eventually her mother as well. What did they feel like and how were they held back by the roles that they were given and how did they try to break free from those roles? And, and, and how did they struggle with breaking free from those roles? That's kind of the first piece of it. If this story had been told by her mother or her father, it would be quite different because I think they would think this is a pursuit of happiness. This is me trying to pursue my personal dream, right? For the children in the household, this looks um, totally different because while the parents are trying to pursue their dreams we have children who are then being growing up in a very unstable environment so this instability affects um diane really um it has a great impact on her life and it's going to kind of set her up for what happens later so Think about, you know, the idea of conformity and breaking away from conformity and kind of that theme that runs throughout the book. We're going to hear people use phrases um, like tune in and turn on and drop out. We're going to hear people talk about um, living on the commune and getting away from society and breaking free from the shackles and living like nobody else has and dropping out of society, which is just materialism and, and BS um, and all of that kind of thing. But these are not two single adults. They have a family. So um, basically, Diane is forced in this, to this position of parentification. And if I haven't talked about this before, um, basically, parentification means that there is a role reversal where the parents expect the children to kind of be in charge and to take care of them. In particular, a lot of times, children will take care of their parents' emotional needs in a way that is inappropriate and crosses boundaries. And I don't mean here with... um it's not like sexual abuse, although that does happen in the book as well. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But what I mean is like um, Diane's mother is upset with her father. Instead of talking to her father about it, she goes to Diane and cries and tells her everything that happened and kind of expects Diane to be like a therapist. Um, there is also a like a role reversal in terms of um, some other parental duties as her parents start to do drugs. Diane is responsible for taking care of her brothers and sisters, making sure that they all get to school on time, making sure their homework's done, giving them breakfast in the morning, making dinner at night, all of those things that her parents should be doing. So I would like you to kind of, um, as we start the book, think about how all of these things affected her emotionally and affected her mental health and her spirituality, I guess, to a certain extent, because she does touch on that as well, um, how all of these things affected her and kind of, um, in some ways, make her think that she's grown up quite quickly, so that by 13, she's emancipated from her parents, and in other ways, really keep her quite immature and don't allow her to grow up in the proper way and kind of set her up for searching for parental figures in her life. Um, one of the other aspects of this book is that it is the sexual revolution of the 1960s. There is a lot of sex in this book, 
a lot more sex than other books that we have looked at. Part of Diane's journey is really intricately woven into this idea of um, her coming of age and her kind of sexual awakening. Um, the difficulty is that you have a real dropping of boundaries at this point in time. So it is very easy for adults to take advantage of her and to exploit those boundaries. Now, prior to all of this happening, prior to them moving to California, Diane is abused by her grandfather. There is, um, I will uh, note in our learning management system in our class shell um, where that scene occurs for anyone who wants to skip it. So it's like a, a trigger warning ahead of time. There's another assault that takes place at the hands of Charles Manson later um, on in the book. And I will note that for you as well in case you want to skip those parts. But basically because of the earlier molestation by her grandfather and because of the dropping of the boundaries and because of the lack of any parental oversight and also the fact that really people are still, in some ways they're talking about sex and in other ways they're not talking about sex. So they're kind of holding on to some very puritanical or 1950s kind of values of like, we don't talk about it. Um, they, they, her parents at different times when she's about 13 ask her if she needs birth control, but they don't actually talk to her about what that means, how babies are made, um, how um, sexually transmitted diseases because later on there's, there's an incident with, um, I think gonorrhea or chlamydia and, um, all of those kind of things. So for her, there's a lot of confusion. Now I will also say that on the other hand, she does talk about sex feeling pleasurable at different points, um, as she's sort of choosing to have sex with people. I say sort of because a lot of the people that she's choosing are adults and she's like 13, 12, 12, 13, 14. So her, you know, level of um, ability to consent is really um, not there because she's underage and doesn't really understand what's going on. But um, I, I really want you to look for this as a theme in the book that the complexities of sex and the, its tie-in to this sexual revolution where um, there's a lot of group sex going on and, and a lot of the people in the communes are kind of hanging out all together. And for her, it's, it's sex and it does feel good, but at the same time, there are there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of manipulation, there's a lot of... Um, uh, emotional confusion is the best word that I can use right now. So we're going to be um, kind of talking about some of those things and how they play a role because this is, as I said, this is kind of a book about coming of age, but in a way similar to Girl Interrupted, it's a story about how, how coming of age was kind of arrested or interrupted or warped. Um, so that she can't really have um, be the teenager that she kind of really struggles to and wants to be. Another theme that we're going to see is the drug use. So I think what's interesting here is that in the beginning chapters of the book, drug use is at first seen as kind of a positive thing that people are are smoking pot and then later using acid to have mind altering experiences and to alter their reality and to um expand their ways of thinking and to kind of loosen up and and hang out and, and have a good time this pretty quickly changes. So her um, her father is the, the person who introduces her to marijuana and, um, and also LSD. What ends up happening then is that um, first, there are people who are getting hooked on these drugs and sometimes harder drugs, 
um, and becoming um, addicted to them w when we get to the scenes in California. But more importantly is that the um, many of the gurus and cult leaders, including Charles Manson, are using these drugs to control people. So giving them access to these things when um, they're, they're kind of craving them, but also using LSD in particular to alter perception so that people's minds are not clear. So he's basically setting himself up as this messianic um, messiah christ-like kind of figure that he is man's son he's the son of man he's the son of god he's the second coming of christ he is not the only person to say this um many people at the time and even today if you look at some of the um the the flds the, the fundamentalist latter-day saints that are in utah where they have these men who have plural marriages with girls starting at age eight or nine. Um, Warren Jeffs, their compound was raided. Um, I think that happened maybe five, six years ago. Um, we also have the Nexium cult that took place right near us, um, right in Clifton Park outside of Albany, where um, Keith Raniere was kind of setting himself up as almost this messianic figure and trying to draw young girls in, and they were um, coming in under the understanding that it was like a self-help group where um, they would kind of learn skills for like pers interpersonal and business skills and, and those kind of things. Um, Scientology, which Manson drew a lot of his ideas from, all of that. So Diane talks quite a bit about uh, where all of these ideas came from and essentially for a person who is a sociopath, they're a chameleon a lot of times, and they're kind of being who they need to be for different people and without any kind of remorse and that kind of thing. So a lot of um, uh, narcissism, a lot of pathological lying, all of those kind of things. And I want you to see the ways in which she's taken in by this at first, the ways in which she's kind of questioning it bit by bit. Um, up until the murders happen, but also the way in which she is inhibited from questioning it because of the large amounts of drugs that are being used. Because he's giving them LSD, playing records for them over and over and over, singing his songs to them, and then um, as they're having these experiences, basically saying to them, oh, this is this is me. If you see colors, that's me, and I'm God's spirit, and I'm coming for you, and I'm giving you this whole experience, and I died for you, and I am dying for you, over and over and over. The process that he uses of brainwashing is really intricately tied into this drug use. So, essentially, um, another theme that I want you to look for is her trying to seek out a family. So the idea of family in this book, she's calling it a member of the family, but the the word family is used in different ways in different places of the memoir. So at first it's her family, then it's um, the, the family that she kind of finds as she um, becomes involved with an older couple who bring her into their home. Um, then it's the Manson family. Later on, it's a, a family that kind of is uh, fostering or adopting her. Later on, it's the family that she's creating with her husband. So how are all of these things playing into her psychology and how is she trying to seek out a family and seek out a stable mother figures and father figures and um, other people who treat her kind of like a kid sister and how does that kind of become a family for her and what does family mean to Diane? Um, that's a question I'd like you to kind of ask. What would having a family mean to a kid who was kind of neglected and, um, and forced to be almost like a parent before she was really ready? Her vulnerability and her seduction into this cult 
are really tied to, I think, those three things. Um, the idea of family and having a group that of people who love you and give you positive reinforcement and feedback. Um, number two, um, her, her growing uh, confusion with sex and sexuality. And then number three, um, the drug use and the way that drugs are used to kind of control people. Um, the idea of control and violence and those being tied is another thing I'd like you to look at. Diane very briefly mentions, and because again, this book is not salacious and it's her story and not her mother's, but she does mention a number of times her father um, hitting or physically abusing her mother. She does not go into detail on this, but it's not unusual for a person who has witnessed domestic violence to become involved in a domestically violent situation. So, what I'd like you to look at is what are the patterns of behavior, the emotional and psychological abuse that her father kind of puts her family through, as well as some of the physical abuse. How do those patterns affect her, but also how are those patterns later repeated when she joins the cult? Because there are a number of tactics that Charles Manson is using to keep these women kind of hostage. And you can see that at first Diane thinks that she's the only one who is getting slapped or being screamed at, um, those kind of things, but she is not the only one. This really is happening to all these women, but separately. Um, and the way that he uses separation to kind of keep them apart from um, each other and devoted to him is, again, another way of control. But those repeated patterns of abuse of the cycle of um, the honeymoon phase and being really sweet to people and um, kind of bringing them in and having their guards be down and then um, control and then violence um, and then um, typically after the violence, uh, a start of the, the cycle again and repeating itself um, to kind of keep people from leaving. Also, the threat of what happens if they were to leave is kind of also there. Um, if you leave or if I leave you, what's going to happen to you? You can imagine it, for example, for Tyann's mother in the late 1950s, the very early 1960s, um, if her father leaves, what is her mother going to do with very few prospects as a woman who does not really have an education and has been um, basically a stay-at-home mom? So, Gender rules, <laughs> tying into that. Um, besides just sex and sexuality, there's a lot here with gender roles. And um, we see with Diane's parents and some of the people that they're talking with, the ideas of this counterculture revolution also affecting the roles of women and the ways in which the women's movement is kind of starting up. So the second wave of feminism the first wave of feminism was um, leading up to 1920 when women were granted the right to vote. The second wave happens in the 1960s and 70s as women demand things like um, equal pay um, and better job opportunities and um, better educational opportunities and, and things of that nature. So what is the role of women? Um, how do women um, function in this book, particularly, um, you know, in the first 10 chapters, how are the roles of women changing? How are women kind of struggling with those changes? How does Diane kind of place herself in that movement of, um, is she kind of more subservient? Is she kind of more outspoken? And then how do women function in Charles Manson's cult? I don't want to give it away, but I can tell you not well. Um, but how are they kind of used? And even though he's supposed to be this guru talking about new age ideas and, and sticking it to the man and all of that kind of thing, the, what is the hypocrisy that happens there? Um, a lot of this is tied into sex and sexuality and the changing of 
um, changing ideas surrounding sex. Um, so I would like you to kind of look for some of those connections. The escalation to violence we kind of talked about in the last lecture. Um, that's something that I want you to look for, though. And, and again, um, you know, along with the idea of the patterns of abuse, how do things escalate and how do you, um, how is it easy for people to kind of not see fully what's going on or around them or how are they unable to kind of guess what's going to happen next? And then lastly, toward the end of the book, we talk a little bit more about mental health and the process of recovery. So um, Susanna Kaysen's book, Girl Interrupted, which I mentioned just a little bit ago, um, she spent 18 months in a mental institution and it was for the most part um, depicted as a negative experience that her girlhood was interrupted that here in the around the same time period um, as this book takes place that Kaysen is kind of almost trapped almost as a type of inmate in this mental hospital where her parents have sent her here we have um we don't have a full description, I would say, because the memoir really focuses on what led up to her being in the cult and then her time in it, and then a little bit about how she had to testify and, and what that meant for her in her new life that she was trying to form. But she does describe the role of the mental hospital and how it really helped her and how she kind of enjoyed being there. It gave her some stability. They worked on deprogramming her um, and meaning that they're taking all those <laughs> ideas out of her head. When she first goes in, the doctors think that she might have schizophrenia. Later on, she's, it, she's diagnosed with LSD-induced psychosis. And um, she really talks about the things that helped kind of save her from going completely insane and um and becoming catatonic and you know all of that kind of thing so i'd like you to kind of look for that as well in this book what's what does mental health mean what does it mean for her to be healthy um how is she able to what makes her able to overcome the circumstances that she found herself in and um, and how does she kind of take responsibility for the role that she did play in terms of um, at least being with Manson and in that family and in the commune with them and, and all of that kind of thing. So that basically wraps it up. Those are some of the themes that I'd like you to look at. Um, in terms of the plot arc, we see somebody who kind of starts out high at a very um, good place, um, slowly has a descent, and then kind of comes back up on top. So it is um, <laughs> the, the type of um, plot arc that we've been talking about the whole time. Here, the... Um, well, many people start low and then go high, but here she starts high and then she's kind of brought down low and then she she recovers. Here, um, you don't have to guess about the climax or the turning point of the book because it's pretty obvious. But really, um, more than, than that, I'd like you to think about how this is a character-driven book. Um, Diane's voice is very clear. She has told her story a number of times. Um, she has a, a very good memory for detail and for recreating some of the scenes of things that happened and conversations that took place. And so I'd like you to kind of look for that and her very straightforward style as well. Um, in times when she is in particular um, distress, like when she is being abused or when she is kind of threatened by Manson or some of the people in his family, she describes things in almost a clinical way. So I guess that's the last piece that I would like you to look for. So some of the themes, um, the general plot arc, the character development, how she comes of age during all of this, how this is um, 
also kind of warping or interrupting that coming of age process and the themes that we talked about as well as her style. That's it. I can't wait to see your thoughts on the book and I look forward to reading them. Thanks everyone.